show where we talk about all the crazy jobs we do to make the cash we need to pursue our artistic dreams. And so you can offer pride scholarships to actors worldwide who identify as LGBTQ plus or lunch at Chipotle. Today we're talking about that theme park position and the movie theater mystique. And let's not overlook the old retail detail. We are your hosts, Jamie Parker Stickle and Jason Bieber. And on this episode, we are talking to a supremely talented and generous actor, writer, and director. He was just nominated for a Queerty Award for his portrayal of patient slash victim, Jerry Summers, in the Peacock original miniseries, Dr. Death. Yes. His dark and hilarious short film, Sam Did It, won at the Catalina Film Festival, the LA Comedy Festival, and the Sonoma Film Festival, to name a few. And his thriller script, Check Surroundings for Safety, made the highly prestigious Hollywood blacklist. As an actor, he boasts over 75 television and film credits. I mean, just having two on IMDb makes you a star. Way to go, um, honey. Yeah, I mean, including regular appearances on shows like Dr. Death, The Magician's my favorite, mm -hmm. Modern Family, and The Santa Clarita Diet. So please, welcome to the podcast, the crazy talented and unbelievably kind, Dominic Burgess. Woo! Oh, oh my gosh, you guys went down a research rabbit hole. Yes. <laughs> So I want to preface, because as we go into these side hustles, this is our very first guest who is non-American. Oh, I know. Oh, my no. gosh. No, no, no. Nope. Sarah's Canadian. Oh, you're right. Sarah's Canadian. And so is Mara was Canadian. And Mara's Canadian. This is our first Brit. This is our first. Oh, wow. I'll take it. Our first yes. overseas import. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we can. Oh, boy. Yeah, we're not talking about O1 visas, but <laughs> oh no, we will talk about O1 visas because it, it play yeah, it plays into the types of job that I was allowed to get while yeah. I was in LA. Yeah, yeah. visas. Because yeah. you didn't come over for a film or for a television show, is that correct? You came over to work in Hollywood to to go that avenue. Do you want my Universal Studios story beginning to let's, end? Let's, my let's whole start from the story. beginning, go all the way to the end, and then oh we'll my jump back gosh. to Alton Towers. <laughs> okay. Universal Studios. I initially went down, I think they were holding auditions at the Beverly Hotel, like on Vineland, and I went to be to audition to be a tour guide. And mm. you go, and there's a whole masses of people there to be tour guides and i'm sure lots of them are actors and the audition process is they give you sides or the script that you would do uh as you yeah uh, go around the, the tour and i'm pretty good at cold reading i can pick it up and say hey in 1963 alfred hitchcock made psycho look on your right hand side there's a psycho house um cool i felt like i was personable and fun and then they they called everyone like they you have numbers on and they call people by number and I was like oh. it's called a cattle call for those oh, not I, in the industry listening this is a true cattle call yeah I didn't my my number didn't get called this is so this is so weird uh, and I went and I asked the people that were running I was like hey guys like do you have any feedback like was there something that I did and they're like well you know. People that come to Universal Studios are going to be wanting like the all American experience. And so we think it might be jarring to them to have a tour guide who's, uh, they might have to tune their ears and be like figuring out where you're from. I was like, what? <laughs> what? Really? So that was the feedback I got from that. Cut to two or three months later, up at Universal City Walk, they're holding auditions to be. Uh, improvisers on British Street, like the red soldiers that you yep. see outside Buckingham Palace with the, the black furry hat. So I was like, perfect. I'm going through the Groundlings program. I can improv. I can go up. And it was a similar situation where they gave everyone a number and they had all the actors stand in a big horseshoe. And the audition was to step forward and say a line in British. So I was like, perfect. I can step forward and I can say a line in British. Um, so I stepped forward and I said whatever line I said and stepped back. And then, you know, other people are stepping forward who did not have good British accents that were like, 
Hello, mate. Hello, and mate. You come to England. <laughs> Cup of tea. God save the Queen. That was pretty good, still, considering. Um, it's very Dick and Van Dyke, it, Mary Poppins. And then again, my number didn't get called. <laughs> oh and I was God. like, oh, hold on. What's happening? So again, I went up to the desk and it was a different group of people. And I was like, I'm so sorry. I'm really sorry. What, what just happened? And they were like, yeah, we didn't feel like your, uh, your accent was strong enough. And I had my paperwork with me this time. I had my British passport and I had my O1 visa. And I was like, I'm British. I got my British passport. <laughs> and they were like, yeah, just uh, other people had stronger accents. So I was like, okay, okay, okay. Cut to a little bit later. I'm so mad now right now. <laughs> now they're holding just general interviews to work in the theme park. And so I went, hoping to get a, a job in some form of entertainment. And again, people lining up outside the front doors and they were holding the interviews in the offices upstairs. And I sit down with this uh, lady and I said, oh, I'd love to work. Any area of, of entertainment in the park would be great. And she was like, well, that's a very competitive area to work in, in the park. But if you get employed in food service, then you can transfer to the entertainment department. So you get hired doing food service and then request a transfer, and then you can go and work in entertainment. So I was like, great, let's do that. Okay. So then I had to, I, I get employed by Universal Studios on food service, and then you have to complete the training for two yeah. weeks um, on food service, which is totally fine. And then the first week, uh, I was put on the the churro cart, Ugh. and which is totally fine, you know, like it's cool, it's fine. fine, whatever. Um, it's got an umbrella. It's fine. But oh, we'll get to that umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I went as soon as like I finished my training, I went upstairs to HR and I was like, "Hey, I completed my training. I'd like to request a, a transfer to to the entertainment department." And they were like. Oh no, you have to complete a season before you can transfer to the entertainment department. So I was like, okay. <laughs> so I was like, you know, it's a job. I need a job. I, I have to make some money. Uh, so I was working on the churro cart and they gave me a cart without a parasol, without an umbrella. And oh, they no. just they just parked me right in the middle of the courtyard outside the Simpsons ride. And I kid you not, I shit you not, it was so hot that my LCD computer screen was bubbling in the heat. <sighs> oh. And I begged my supervisor, I was like, please, you have to, like, I have to have shade. My ears are turning crispy. Like, I've got to go where the shade. And I'm like, got to go where the people are. Got to stay where the people are. Wow. And they wouldn't move me out of the sun. And... Dicks. I think they, they gave me a hat. Um, but oh, I'm so sorry. I, I skipped this part. When you work at Universal, they provide the uniform, but you're not allowed to you're not allowed to take the uniform home. So you turn up to work and then you go to a warehouse that is like a dry cleaners, and everyone waits in line and you have uh, a number. And then your uniform comes along and it's nice because they've dry cleaned it, which I guess is nice. But you could be waiting 20, 25 minutes for your uniform. Then you have to get changed. And then you have to go to the area of the park that you're working in before you can clock in. No, no. So if you're working down in the lower half of the park at the Jurassic Park ride, uh -huh. you have to wait for 25 minutes for your uniform, get changed, walk all the way through the park, go down those four sets of escalators, get to Jurassic Park, then clock in. So if you start work at nine o'clock, you have to turn up at like 7.45, eight o'clock to, to go through the whole system and you're not being paid for that time. And then when you clock out, you have to clock out at Jurassic Park, and then go all the way back. Um, and the employee the parking building. Lot at Universal is just, also not close. I was just going to say because oh, I worked at Universal um, City Walk, I worked at BB King's nightclub, uh -huh. and I had to park in Frankenstein. That was the employee's um, City Walk parking. Mm -hmm. And I 
literally was late my first day because of the crowds because couldn't get into the parking uh-huh. it was a line to get into the parking the crowds were horrible so it took me 45 minutes to get to work and that's all mm. time once you're parked that you're not even getting paid so yours is even yeah. worse I I use um, public transport, uh, so I would jump on the Metro Red Line to mm-hmm. uh, the the Lancashire State mm-hmm. uh, Station down there, yep. or I would take the two two four down Lancashire Boulevard, um, and then I would either have to wait for an employee bus that would take us up the hill, or if that was running late or I'd missed the the slot, I would have to take the tour tram up and then walk across, or I would just walk up that hill you just have to walk up and the just hill. be like. Oh my gosh. Um, when my car was in the shop, I had a friend drop me off and I just walked up the hill. Like, this yeah. is a big yeah. hill, everybody. It's a, it's, it's a big hill. But my, my final straw with Universal was after that first week of work, going to the window to collect my paycheck and opening it and almost, almost being in tears because it was such a pitiful amount. And yep. I was like, what, what? what just happened and then i guess you're on a reduced amount of money because you're training for two weeks and then they take out the taxes and they take out everything they're going to take out but then because you're working in the theme park they take out theme park union dues and oh god damn i was like what is what is this? And I was like, oh, yeah, that's your union dues to become part of the, the theme park uh, workers union. I was like, I don't want that to hang out. And I was like, how much is that? And I was like, oh, you'll be paying that up for like two years. I was like, <laughs> I can't take out $90 of my paycheck I'm like, to, to go to union dues that I like, I'm not going to. So like, you made like $40 and you paid out like a hundred dollars. Yeah, just, and I was just like, I can't, I, I can't emotionally, I can't emotionally do that to myself anymore. So after, after three weeks, I was out of universal. Now, I, because it's universal. I mean, I, there's two ways I want to go with this. Bef- I want to jump back to your original theme park job. Well, to Towers. Towers. But, but yeah. before we do, there's I want to go forward because mm. now you get to go back to Universal with some regularity, but in a very different capacity. In a different capacity. Well, I I am I feel like um I feel like the theme park and universal like it's different. SNBC and Universal yeah. Films are two very separate entities. So much so, in fact, that on one job, was it the good place that I was working on? There was something that I was working on on the Universal Backlot and the theme park was getting very angry at actors that were working on the Backlot that would sneak onto the theme park by the Jurassic Park ride because that was a way in from the uh-huh. Backlot. Um, and we were, we were told off as cast members that we were not allowed to go and ride on Jurassic Park at lunch. <laughs> Um, so I feel like it's two very, very separate things. Uh, but that, I mean, they, they bring your, their tour by, you they know, they do, they do, they do. Um, yeah, they do. Yeah. So, wait a yeah, minute. It's a two-way wait, street buster. Yeah. Wait a minute. What's the umbrella corporation? Um, <laughs> but still it must've, I mean, do you, when, like when you're working on good place and that tour tram goes by and you think back like, Oh, I didn't get that job. I didn't get that job. <laughs> <laughs> wow. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. You know what I bet our listeners are thinking right now? What's that, Beaver? They're probably thinking, this podcast thing is so easy. I could start my own podcast. And you know what? They're right. Yeah, we've been using Anchor for a few months now, and it has totally changed our game. Anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free! I said, let me explain. Fine. There are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. And Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and pretty much anywhere podcasts are streamed. 
You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. I mean, it's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. And it's free. Yes. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. See, that wasn't too bad, was it? Now, let's get back to the show. Let me ask you this. How did you survive? Did you have savings? Because you're taking jobs uniquely. And I would ask this of everybody else, except uh-huh. that I that they're American and I know that they're hustling in other ways or they have parents helping or something's happening to mm-hmm. mitigate that um, difference between what you're bringing in and what's going out for rent and yeah. food. But um, for you... I'm still looking for someone to do that for me. I am too. For <laughs> you... Um, having this particular visa that forces you to work in these specific specific ways mm-hmm. and i know restricts you, restricts you and yeah. i know universal pays poop yep. it's it's criminal it is criminal and the other places you've worked also play like they pay like a high school part-time job mm-hmm. salary yeah so how did you survive i mean gosh i didn't really it was hard. I'll tell you I how it survived. It like- when I first got here, I had every intention of getting a car. Um, and I ended up not getting a car. I, I put all my money into classes. When I first moved here, it was it was November of 2007, and it was the writer strike. And yes. so casting oh, directors painful. had nothing to do other than hold general meetings and take and hold workshops. So I was kind of fortunate in a way that I met more casting directors in three weeks of being in LA than I had done in three years of being in London um, mm-hmm. because casting directors were just meeting new people and, and holding How classes. How did you find out to meet those people though? Like, did you have an agent? Did you have a manager? No, I had, before I moved to America, I um, I did uh, a course at a place called TVI, uh, TVI nice. Acting yeah. Studio yep. TVI. on Ventura nice. Boulevard. And they would do mm-hmm. like these two week intensive international programs. And, mm-hmm. you know, of course, it's one of those things where you come and everyone that you meet is like, Oh, my God, you should come to America, you're you could be a cop any day of the week. Um, and then <laughs> on every show, and then you move to America, and then you reach out to the manager that said that and then they don't reply to your emails. Um, one of those. True. But yeah. um, I did know, like, oh, okay. I kind of know the valley, I'll find a place in the valley. And I looked for places where casting directors were doing workshops and so there went the budget for my car that i planned on that i'd saved for and that there went the money money for this and that um so i tore through my savings very quickly yeah and then i got a job at arclight uh my first interview was at arclight hollywood and again, mm-hmm. I felt like my interview was very personable and like, oh my gosh, I love movies. I know all about movies. I worked at HMV in London. Movies, movies, movies. And I didn't get employed. It was like a group interview. And again, it was like, okay, the following people can stay. And I went up to the guy. Should I say it? I'm not going to say his name um, because it's very recognizable. And <laughs> I don't Steve? Want to... No. no. <laughs> um, the second guy I can say because it was Josh. And that's a, you know, hundreds of people are called Josh. They'll never know. Um, but I went up to this guy and was like, did I do something wrong in, in the interview? And his, his response was, you're a bit too personable. And I don't think you want this as a long-term job. And I was like, oh, okay. So I left. I don't understand. And then I found out the Sherman, Oak, the Sherman Oaks location was also mm-hmm. holding open interviews. So I went to the Sherman Oaks location and I toned every, I pulled everything back and it was mm-hmm. very monotone. And I was very you much like, um, I'm just looking for a long-term job and I'm committed to customer service and <laughs> I think I will fit in here. And I got the job. And yeah, I got the job. Um, oh my God, being, American interviews. Oh my gosh. Um, and... By the way, I drove by the uh, the Arclight Hollywood the other day. Very sad. The Cinerama Dome's all boarded up. Yes and no. Um, yes and no about the set being sad. Yeah. <laughs> yes and no. As an employee there. Uh, so I, sure. I did three stints at Arclight. And much like uh, Comet trying to escape 
orbit of a planet, mm -hmm. it kept pulling me back in. So the first stint, much to, to your point of being so poor and how did I survive, um, there were days where I had no money whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And there was one day in particular, one night, where I was so poor, I had nothing in my British bank accounts. I had nothing. I had less than $20 in my American bank account, so I couldn't even take out a 20. Yep, and, been there. Oh, my gosh. It was like 2 o'clock in the morning, and I had nothing, and I didn't have money to get the night bus home along Ventura Boulevard. And I weigh, I took off my shoes and my socks and rolled up my pants. And there's a fountain out front of what used to be Urban Home and the Cheesecake Factory there. And oh, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I waded into the fountain at like two o'clock in the morning to scrounge enough money to get the night bus yeah. home. Um, and I, would, I was living at Magnolia and Colfax at the time. I found... I found this house for $425 yeah. a month while I was saving for wow. my green card <laughs> in what we call oh, this compound with this 80 year old Austrian lady. <laughs> was who, she holding like a hostel? Was it like, Oh almost, my like God. A... She was, she was renting out like nine rooms in, yep. in her house that were yep. not up to code. Some of the rooms didn't have electrical outlets. They just had extension cords rolling in there. Um, and at one time, there was Nick, Adam, me, uh, Evan, Mona, Guillermo, like all living in this house. One of them was living like in a converted study. One of them was living in, it was just, it was, it was a lot. Um, yeah. But for, but for $425 a month, like I can put up with, you know, the broken windows oh. and Oh, like, oh, friend, for daily, weekly groceries, I accepted room in a friend's room that was an add-on, but it, it was like a drywall that somebody had bolted into the yeah. house to make an additional room, uh -huh. but it wasn't complete. And she said it was a couch in there that I could have. It was an oversized armchair. Oh, no. So I slept on it for, I think, five weeks. I stayed there for five weeks, got uh -huh. a job at Starbucks, made enough to like get a deposit five hundred dollars to you know uh -huh. get a roommate and rent an apartment but um a rent a room in this apartment but yes been there like it was like yeah. it was it's bad out there folks <laughs> uh -huh. and i would the only food that i could really afford that would be like a big enough portion to sustain me i would walk from magnolia and colfax over to magnolia and coenga and there was little caesar's pizza that you could get for yep. five dollars you could get a whole pizza yep. for five dollars mm -hmm. and I'm i would right. make I would make that last for four days. And then I yep. would work at Arclight and we would get popcorn and soda for lunch that was like free. Um, and that that was what I was living off when when I was going through those lean times. Oh, I was at Starbucks. I was I was at Starbucks from 4 30 a.m. till 8 30 a.m. Sometimes I somebody would miss their night shift so I could pick that up. Mm -hmm. Because so you would get free coffee at Starbucks, you got a free drink per shift, uh -huh. but you would get a discount on food. But if you opened and something, oops, fell on the floor, then you could have it or right. go in the trash. Nobody was going to rat on you. Uh -huh. um, Except maybe the rats. But but at night, they throw everything away. Yeah. <clears throat> so you're not allowed to take it as an employee. Uh. It's illegal. So we we would call around and see if shelters would take it, like donate the food because it's sanded, like uh -huh. throw it away. Or, or people would have their friends come in, pretend to be customers. Uh -huh. And at the end of the night, we would say, does anybody want anything? Because we have to put it in the trash because we're closing in 10 minutes. Uh -huh. and, people and your friends would just take it and then you would share it later. Yeah. We would, uh, same thing with the hot dogs at Arclight. At the end of the night, you would mm -hmm. throw, every, you would scoop out all the popcorn into trash bags and throw out uh, the, the hot dogs and we weren't allowed to have any. And then you would have to fill out a waste report and then you would get told off. When I first started at Arclight, it was the most phenomenal job because they were well-staffed and it was really a luxury experience that yeah. guests would come in and there was 
multiple people to, to serve them at box office. There was multiple people at the coffee bar, multiple people at concessions. And there were always two people in every aud- auditorium, two ushers in mm-hmm. every auditorium to show people to their assigned seats. And it was great in that you could just be like, hey, I've got an audition. Doug's going to take my shift. Cool. And then they started expanding really rapidly and they opened yeah. up Pasadena and they opened up Santa Monica and then they went to Chicago and then they went to Washington and they expanded so fast and they became corporate overnight that all of a sudden now we were cleaning auditoriums with 10 minute turnarounds between films. They went down to a skeleton crew. They cut out, they literally removed four box office terminals from our like Sherman Oaks. And we were a skeleton crew all the time. And we were, we were stretched so thin. And, and it wasn't good for the customers. You knew the minute it, it changed, you're oh like, was this place used to be nice? Mm-hmm. Like oh it was gosh. a good, cool date to go to Arclight. It was like, you paid a couple bucks more for that luxury experience on a date. And then it became chaos. And then if you were like, hey, <laughs> Doug's going to take my shift, then you have to think about your business discipline, your professional conduct. You can only switch two shifts a month. You have to fill out this paperwork. It has to be approved by head office. And, oh, shit. Jesus. and then it became a real bear. Um, and by the end, by the time I'd left and come back and... The first time I left, I ghosted. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. The first time I left, I ghosted. Mm-hmm. And then... Did you leave any drawings behind? Nothing. <laughs> I was very good. I just ghosted because... Um, when was... This would have been the, the winter of 2008. And okay. Arclight has blackout periods where you're not allowed to take time off, which is December, I guess, you know, for the holidays. Mm-hmm. Um Anytime. All the places that don't pay you any money yeah. have Thanksgiving, blackout. Thanksgiving through to the new year uh, is a blackout yeah. period, so you can't have time off. And Retail's the same. It was my first year in LA, and I was like, oh my gosh, I just I want to go back to England for Christmas. And they were like, no, I can't do it. And so I just stopped going to work. Um, and then, then after I came back, that was where my brief uh, Universal Studios and Blockbuster video uh, stories come into play. Then when I went back to Arc, like, oh, let's come back to Blockbuster video, though, because that's funny, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when I came back, I went back to Arclight and I knocked on the manager's door and I was like, guys, why did you stop scheduling me? <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, what? And I was like, you guys just stopped scheduling me. Oh, uh, like over the holidays, and they were like, <laughs> "Are you sure?" I was like, "Yeah, guys, <laughs> you just stop scheduling me." And then they were like, "Oh," Jesus. and there was no record. There was no <laughs> record of me just ghosting, and so they were like, "Oh, yeah, we'll we'll put you back on shift." And I remembered enough that I didn't have to retrain or anything. The second time I left Arclight <laughs> was. Because I booked a role in oh, Baby good. Geniuses 3, yes, 4, you did. and 5. Yeah. Back Shot back to back, back in the same week. <laughs> back, back to back over a 10-week period. And we went to Alaska. There was no need for it to be in Alaska because it was all <laughs> in a warehouse. Um, but, it get, you know, you do what you do and you do what you have mm-hmm. to do. And it was a great experience. And I made <laughs> lifelong friends and I had a good time. And it was Alaska and it was great. Um, but then when I came back, the baby genius people were like, oh, yeah, we're going to go back for six, seven and eight. So oh. hold on. So it was like then I was like living off the baby genius money, thinking, well, I'm not going to go back to Arclight again because we're going to go back to alaska for another three months um and they kept dangling that carrot and that never happened and so then sheepishly my comet came back into the orbit of arc line and i was like i'm back um (laughs) for the third and final stint when it was at peak atrociousness when now by this point 3d movies were a really big thing and Mm -hmm. so then at the end of the night you'd be washing 3D glasses until three in the morning. 
And I'd been there long enough now at this point that I had responsibility and I was a supervisor. They got rid of the supervisor positions, but then put the extra pressure on the crew members. So I was closing up. I was closing up the back office at like three in the morning, make sure there was no one in the building, making sure that the, the, the floats were balanced and that there was money in the safe at the end of the night for 8.25 an hour. Um, oh, God. Oh, my gosh. Uh, and the final... I mean, this is four years in and you're still at... That's oh, minimum wage. Yeah, because I think I started at like 7.50 an hour. Then it, like you have your review and you go up to 7.75 an hour and then like 25 cent increments. But because I left and come back a couple of times, uh, that made things well, stagnant for when... they stopped scheduling you, so... They stopped scheduling me, guys. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh. And by the end, the, the final straw was I, I booked a role on a show called Ant Farm that was going to be three weeks. And this yeah. was in December, I think, December of 2013 now at this point. And I went to them and I was like, hey guys, I booked this television show. I'm happy to work on weekends. Uh, and then I'll be back in the new year full time again. And they gave me the ultimatum. This was my ultimatum of, well, you have to decide because you can either stay at Arclight or you can go and do this job for three weeks and then you're not going to have a job. Um, again, should I say this man? I'm not going to say this man his name. Um, but I stuck <laughs> my tongue out. Are they a famous actor now? No, they are not. They are not. He, oh, gosh. He knows who he gonna, is. He knows who he is. Um, I mean, a lot of the managers there were nightmares. Um, but yeah, they gave me the ultimatum and I was like, well, obviously I'm going to do the acting job. And yeah. that acting job ended up being for 18 episodes, which lasted me. That right. that was that was the moment that, that was my last day job. Arclight was, the third stint at Arclight was my last day job. Um, and then there were a couple of like, oh gosh, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Um, before being able to stabilize and be like, okay, I can, I can survive as an actor. Um, but that was the moment when they gave me the ultimatum that I had to choose between an acting job and arc light. Kind of a gift. I mean, what? it's not a gift. It's stupid. It's stupid. If I'm you just... are, if it's Los Angeles, you know that you are employing young actors mm -hmm. or actors who need to, it should be a, a universal understanding also, I believe that we work harder in general because mm -hmm. we are knowing mm -hmm. that we are committed. We, we overcommit to these mundane things because we know that we need to take a little advantage sometimes to go to the audition and come back. So mm -hmm. we're going to work twice as hard, be more available, do the shitty shifts uh -huh. if we have to. Yeah. You, because if you be have an, an audition, understanding. Yeah, yeah, you'll take that closing Friday night shift because Absolutely. I've got an audition on Thursday morning and you're taking that. Yep, I'll do yeah. it um, because I've that's got to do that audition. That's um, how it works. And that's how it was when I first got employed uh, before yeah. they mm -hmm. turned super corporate. So I know that Arclight is gone now and it's it's very sad. Yeah. But is it? The old Arclight was gone long before Arclight yes. was gone. So when that's it was, when it was When it was just sad. the Hollywood and the Sherman Oaks location, yeah. it was glorious. And then yeah. they... and I worked those two locations. Not oh, you did? At, I didn't work at Arclight. Oh. I worked the, um, I stood outside with a clipboard and said, do you want to see a movie oh. for Neil? Yes. And people always did because it was uh -huh. the Arclight and it was nice. And so they're yeah. like, yeah, I'll go see a free movie and stay like two extra minutes to answer some questions afterwards. I mean, yeah. but I almost went back to that job that Arclight had already changed and people were like, nah, nah, uh -huh. don't, nah, nah. I'm, I'm here out of obligation as it is to see this movie uh -huh. here right now, which was really funny. But we, we went on our second date to your Arclight. You did? Yeah. Nice. Sherman I mean, Oaks? 500 Days of Sorrow. Oh, yeah. Do you know, right. like, Again, I've made uh, my friend Ian and Vanessa and Jordan. Dan, I've made lifelong friends at Arclight. Yeah. Lifelong friends. And I I am so glad. And I, I know those people. Um, but it wasn't, by the end, certainly it wasn't a fun job at all in, in any way. Um, yeah. But I, I missed out on Blockbuster in the in Yeah, my, I was going to say. In my Exodus. Yeah. My three-week no. experience at Blockbuster. I don't oh. even understand how Blockbuster was still 
open then. I this thought was, they had all closed by then. This was 2009, Eight. early 2009. Oh. This would have been. Um, okay. Were you working at the last Blockbuster? <laughs> I was working at Blockbuster on Glen Oaks Boulevard in Burbank. Um, so uh -huh. just as you go up the hill and I would yep. take the 183 bus from Magnolia and Colfax all the way to Burbank and then walk up the hill. Lots yep. of hills in my Oh, oh in my all history. over LA. <laughs> um, and I lasted three weeks. Again, I did the two weeks training and then I had an emotional breakdown. It wasn't an emotional breakdown. I, because I worked at HMV in England, which is a DVD store and it was like a library and I'm, I'm very, you can see, it went on on video yeah, for the podcast. It's beautiful. But like, I loved, I, I loved I, HMV in New York. Oh my gosh. Everything, everything here is alphabetized and I'm, I love physical media. And so my first week at work, I organized the entire outer wall at Blockbuster alphabetically, perfectly. It was wonderful. And then we had a delivery and it was something like Horton Hears a Who and mm -hmm. they they put it like in the middle of this wall but they had moved the i films in front of h and then i was like guys that's not alphabetic you can't put h after you no <laughs> no i robot goes over here no um <laughs> and i had a meltdown because the manager was like oh we have a loose alphabetical system here <laughs> that's why i'm gonna oh. buy I emotionally, I emotionally couldn't handle it. And people would come in and they'd be like, hey, I'm looking for a fellowship of the ring. I'd be like, yep, science fiction fantasy. And they'd be like, where's two towers? And I would look on the computer and it was filed under action. And I was like, I, I, I can't, I can't, I couldn't. And I also, because I was finishing work at like midnight, by the time the store closed and you were like putting things back on the shelves, the 183 bus, didn't run at night and so there was no way for me to get home and Lyft and Uber wasn't a thing then and I didn't have a car because I couldn't afford one um and so I would get taxis home and I was like making 30 Aye. I was making like 20 30 bucks a shift doing that and I was like there's no way there's no way I could sustain it's ever a, yeah. doing that there's just I'm no way I'm surprised you use taxis I'm I was that person like we had like a network um there was like several of us at each job that we we would try to help each other out uh -huh. with like carpooling yeah or so, so if somebody was a busser then we'd be like okay i'll work the late shift or mm -hmm. i'll pick you up and she'll drive you home and like we we tried to work out a system we were all women though That's there, were, probably... there were times uh when i was working at arc lights where if i didn't have the money for the for the bus home and it wasn't too late like if i finished at nine o'clock uh, the 183, the last, I think the last 183 that would come down Magnolia was like 9.13 or 9.18. And if you miss that bus, you were done. Um, yeah. But there were plenty of nights that I worked, that I walked from Arclight, Sherman Oaks to Magnolia and Colfax, like three miles. Oh, um, man. Like after yeah. a shift to, to get home because it was just like, oh, okay. But also, I just want to clarify for a lot of people, a lot of our listeners probably don't use the bus. Um, so I just want to specify if you've never used the bus system anywhere, especially to get to a job and from a job, you have to plan an extra hour for that. Yeah. Because yeah. And in Los Angeles, it's a very special animal. It's, uh -huh. it's, it's such a long commute on the bus. It mm -hmm. is you motion sickness, take your motion sickness pills, number one. Number two, I, I could not the several times I took the bus, I was just like, nope, uh -huh. I cannot do this. I can't, I mean, I, I'd rather chance I, a car breaking down. I, I would have to, even to get to auditions, I, I knew my bus route. So I'd walk from Magnolia and Colfax to the Red Line station on Lancaster and Chandler, and then take the Red Line to Hollywood and Highland. And then I would take the 217 yeah. down Fairfax. And yeah. then I would jump on the number, uh, is it the four or the 704 that goes down Santa Monica to get to fifth street studios to do a commercial audition oh, where they're like God. you're asleep on a bench <laughs> okay great and then you would spend another three hours getting back home um you know what you're talking about one audition is you know could in santa monica is a full day oh my it's gosh that was a place um the worst i i could get to the fifth street studios on uh in santa monica that was fine because it was by the time you've done the red line the two on seven and the four like it was three changes 
the worst place to get to. I don't know if you've ever been to 2701 Ocean Park Boulevard. Sure. Yeah. All the, that's my number I, one studio. And that. you know who can't get you there ever? Waze. Waze will drive oh. you into a house behind <laughs> it. Do not use Waze to get it, there. It, that was the very worst yeah. because you had to switch to a separate bus line. Yeah. That was the big, mm, the big bus or some the big blue bus. And there was a completely separate line to LA Metro. Um, yeah, and, that's Santa Monica's own bus line. Yeah. yeah. And so that yeah. was a, anytime there was an audition at 2701, especially if it was an early audition, if it was like a 10 a.m. audition or a 4.45 p.m. audition. Yeah. They like them at the end of the day. Well, I found oh out what gosh. that was. That is because they, they like those end of day auditions on Friday. Uh, which is a nightmare for the actors. It's because those are when the client flies in from Chicago or New York or wherever. The weekend. They, they, they get the weekend in LA. Oh yeah, you told me that. So they oh, come in boy. for an afternoon audition. They have their night, they have their weekend, they fly back for work on Monday. Fucking oh, all gosh. About the clients. We'll be right back. Let's get back to the show. I have to tell you, this whole conversation. I don't know how to start a petition. I don't know how SAG after like how to rally people, but we need to change this. Like it's not okay. It's not okay. You know, I don't want young people coming out here with a dream to be told, well, you just don't want it enough if you can't make it work. Uh -huh. This is not okay. There's no romanticizing being poor, being this stressed out, creating this much anxiety that you have to then take one of those beta blockers to even audition because of all the anxiety you had getting to that audition, be it work, tr the, the commute, the bus. The, I mean, it's just not okay. I mean, this message that we're giving to people. Probably a world in which when I first got to LA in a parallel universe somewhere, maybe I got the car instead of going to all those casting director workshops, but then I wouldn't have made those connections. And yeah, yeah I don't know. Well, yeah, it, it's that thing where you like, you look back and it, what, everything that you went through got you to where you are. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh, exactly. I, I guess um, now sometimes I'll teach at the, the acting studio at BGB um, where mm -hmm. I, I did the, the two scholarships. Um, and I get, I mean, I, I don't really consider it a, a side hustle. Um, sometimes yeah. I'll teach like on camera or, or improv or, or writing there. Um, but it's, I'm very fortunate and knock on wood, I know I'm, I'm very lucky that now it's not really about making the money that, I mean, like, yeah, I'll be like, oh, that's great. Like it's a little bit of extra money and I can, I can get some Blu-rays. Um, but it, it, you know, when it comes from more of a place of power, be like, oh, yeah, I would like to teach that class for, for that week. And it's not coming from a place of, I've got to take that class because otherwise I'm going to be eating Little Caesars pizza for this month. Um, yeah. yeah. Which was the dark times. At yeah. The yeah. House the first, with the first one and, tastes okay. It's that second and third Little Caesars yeah. that starts to attack your nervous system. Yeah. Yes. Let me ask you a question. Mm-hmm. If you were to give, if you could give a scholarship to young Dominic, yes. Oh boy, what would you? A scholarship, or, or like, if you could afford your your young self to have circumvented one of these experiences, be it a job, be it uh, not having a car, is if there's something you could go back and change. Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! I don't know because I still consider myself very fortunate to i don't know because now i get in my head about would that change the present would right, i have met yeah. the people that i'm gonna meet because i met wonderful people like i guess i didn't need the universal studios job and i guess i didn't need the blockbuster job i mean i needed them at the time but like looking back i didn't make like friends from those places or like it didn't impact my life in any i mean i don't know I don't know. Um, I was I was very you fortunate. Say, leave it all the same. Yeah, I I was very fortunate when I went to to drama school in London. Um, I got a scholarship to to drama school because there would have been no way that I would have been able to afford to live in London and pay for drama school. Um, so when I was in London, I 
in my summer breaks, I went back to Walton Towers. I went to Walton Towers in, in my hometown, which is the UK's number one theme park. Um, and then during drama school, it was HMV and the real estate agents. Oof. Oh, Kinley Folkert and Hayward. Oh, Good yeah. afternoon, Kinley Folkert and Hayward. Dominic speaking, how can I help you? Um, oh, he's got it down. I still got it. It'll be in me forever. Um, and that was, you know, working for a lettings agent. And I was pretty much just their Saturday boy and fill-in guy that would literally open up flats and be like, have a look around. I'm not on commission. If you like it, get it. If you don't, well, I don't care. <laughs> um, and then did they think my... they were training you to be an agent, though? Um, were they like? There was stints where I would fill in if people were sick or if people were going on vacation. Then I would fill in for a week or two weeks, and I still wasn't on commission then. And I was like, guys, should I be on commission? Mm. Like, if I'm here yeah. for like two weeks in this office, should I be on any kind of commission? That and they were like, no, you shouldn't. So then I was like, <laughs> okay, but I have a Kinley Falcott and Hayward story for you. Mm. I, ju- I was going through the O1 one visa process mm-hmm. and I had a little red Corsa and people would come into the office and then I would drive them from flat to flat that they were going to look at. And one Saturday morning, I picked up this lady and we're driving to this flat and I come to a roundabout and I do my due diligence. I'm a safe driver and I look right, I look left, I look right, start pulling out and there's a thud and there's an old lady on the bonnet of my car, on the hood of my car. My passenger who I'm about to show a flat screams at the top of her lungs as this old lady slides down the hood of my car and she's got a bag (laughs) of milk this is a bbc comedy i don't understand this carton of milk spills and bleeds out into the road as if it's blood (laughs) there's pedestrians that are screaming and huddling around this old lady i get out of the car very good. I do the right thing. I call, I call 999, which is the British Emergency Service number. Um, Seems easier. And I call, and it's like I'm having an out-of-body experience because this old lady is writhing on the floor as all these people are huddled around her. And the dispatch caller is saying, like, what's happened? I said, uh, this is an old lady. She's been hit by a car. And then they <laughs> they ask for the old lady's name. And I can see that she's an old, old lady. But because she's in earshot, I don't want her to think that I think she looks old. And so I'm like, uh, <laughs> she's she's maybe around 50 years old. And then all these people that are huddled around her look at me and they're like, and they start they start pointing, pointing up they start pointing up as if like she's older and then i'm like she's maybe 60 and they're like oh. i'm like she could be 70 or 80 but i felt so bad i felt so bad that this old lady was gonna think that i thought that she looked old while she was writhing around dear halle berry dominic doesn't oh know God. what a 50 year old lady looks oh like oh my gosh I'm so um, glad you didn't hurt her feelings. Oh my gosh. <laughs> anyway, the, the police came. I got breathalyzed. I very rarely drink. I was not drinking. Um, I got home. I asked, I asked this lady if she still wanted to go and look at the at the <laughs> She was like, You had to. No, take me out. And then I went home early for the day and I was surprised and she even did. wanted you to get wanted oh you to give her a ride. Gosh. Yeah, I, I'm then, American, so I probably would have been like, yes, I want to go look at them. Oh and let's talk gosh. about what just happened. By the way, we've driven in the UK a few times. We've almost hit many people. I, I have caused oh. many near misses. I mean, I'm- I, I checked out. I called the police. Like They gave me a number, and I, I called, and I checked up, and they had CCTV footage from the roundabout. And oh. she had, it wasn't my fault, she was racing to catch a bus that was on the opposite side of the road 
And she had my, the bonnet of my car, the hood of my car was over the white line already into the roundabout because I was like ready to, to pull out. And she had run into the roundabout proper. And there was a pedestrian crossing like five meters behind my car that she didn't use. She just ran out into, into, the, middle. into oh. the road. And I was, okay. you know, I was literally, I was pulling out at like two miles an hour onto this. So she was fine. I sent her flowers. Yeah, the only way she got hurt was how fast she was going because, like, she ran into like a basically stopped car. She mm-hmm. ran into a basically stopped car, but oh, I thought I was going to lose my O one visa. I thought that I was going to have a criminal record and I wouldn't be able to work in the United Dominic, States. Dominic, this is America. It was. You'd oh my fine. gosh. <laughs> I, uh, but I think there's one burning question that I have that I think everybody listening is going to want to know. Do you now have a car? I don't have a car. What? I don't. Oh my God. Ladies and gentlemen, he still I, uses the bus. I still, um, well, my <laughs> boyfriend is going to pop out from the bedroom in a minute and be like, um, I drive him everywhere. When he's, oh my gosh, he's so wonderful. Um, if he's in town, he's a stuntman. And so he'll work for long stints in, in and out of town. Um, if, cool. um, sometimes I'll still take public transport. Like if I'm just going down to, to Universal, um, what was I doing? I think when I was doing Star Trek Picard, um, I just jumped on the 224 that takes you right to the like gate number two at Universal Studios. Yeah, like, some of the bu- bus lines, some of the metro on the bus line is like great. If you're near yeah. it, that's it's great. Um, or if we used to live off the gold line. Which yeah, we used to live off the gold line. Uh-huh. We take the gold line downtown. It was great. Yeah. Um, if I'm going to the Hollywood Bowl, I'll jump on the red line to Hollywood and Highland mm-hmm. and then yeah. walk yeah. up the hill um, yeah. to the Hollywood Bowl. Um, yeah, so I'll, even if you drive so. even if you drive yeah. yeah so i'll i'll still use public transport now i have gotten a little bit lazy with lyft and uber um okay i there. kind of gosh it's I never, not lazy you're you're lining someone's pocket who needs it it's their side hustle yeah. i, I never thing. enjoyed driving it was always like point a to point b I'm, i've never been a person who's like i'm just gonna take a drive along mulholland drive for shits and giggles and the view um because driving gives me anxiety um yeah i do keep threatening to go to to burbank and just have a couple of lessons and get my license just so that i have my license so that if i work on a production they don't have to lock down the street and do like special provisions for me um yeah i just got so used to not having it and i got so used to just getting around london on public transport um if i needed to get into central london that i just yeah i don't enjoy dry it gives me anxiety no it's totally fine you've been away from it for so long that of course it would and it's on the opposite side of the road except that our roads are wide and convenient compared to england even london do drive out here i i know that i'm gonna have to put a post-it note telling me what side of the road to drive on on my steering wheel because i feel like you're coming to it back to it at the right time. We're on the verge of self-driving cars anyway. Yeah. yeah. I think it'd be okay. The, You're uh, saving up for that now. The digital <laughs> chauffeur. Oh, do you have your green card now? Oh, I'm a citizen now. Yes, you are. You're dual. He's a dual citizen. I'm a, I'm a dual, dual citizen. citizen. Um, last April, because I went through all the, my first visa probably cost me six, seven thousand dollars, and then it was like a thousand dollars each year to renew it. My first green card case was ten thousand dollars. My second green card case was ten thousand dollars. So, you know, all in all, to to just try and stay in the country and, and work, I must have I must have burned through like thirty five thousand um, wow. dollars just trying to stay here. So, you know, any, a pound of flesh anything that, that I was making from day jobs was, you know, that's like a year's salary for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at ArcLight. I, I was lucky at ArcLight if I was making twelve thousand dollars a year at ArcLight yeah, because they hundred percent you weren't allowed to go into overtime at mm-hmm. ArcLight. They would cap your hours um, frequently. So, did they even let you work forty hours? No, you you can no, go because over, they didn't you, want you benefits. You couldn't go over forty um, unless it was very special circumstances or unless they crippled themselves by going so understaffed that they couldn't function which they frequently did towards the end 
We had a Starbucks manager. Um, so at Starbucks, we would get benefits. The reason I stayed there was you got benefits at, I can't remember if it's 20 or 24 hours, but mm-hmm. part-timers, as long as you were over 20 hours, let's say, um, you received benefits. Yeah. So I had a store manager and they transferred him because he was just got so many complaints from us, but um, that would reduce my hours like take a shift off so uh-huh. that I, to and put pop me down to 18 so that I wouldn't make my mm. benefits every month no. and when I complained and said I'm here for the benefits he'd say I'm sorry but we're we're overstaffed someone has to and it was no. bullshit I told another store manager who was my friend who had gotten me the job and they were like oh, and they called the regional manager it was like a big deal like he was actually frauding people hours and oh i have gosh. no idea why but I, I don't know if it made him look more profitable as a store like i have no idea what his probably what his motive was but he would pop off a shift for each person just so that we would miss our benefits no it was horrible yeah there's so much anxiety what's insane to me is um I I worked at a theme park in England at Alton Towers, um, and I did two yeah. seasons. The the first season that I worked there, I filled vending machines for the summer, which was fine. It was a job. Um, and I again, think that'd be fun. You you rock up at like four o'clock in the morning. You fill the vending machines before the park yeah opens, and then at nine o'clock you go home. Uh, and it was not enjoyable, but it was you know it was a job. Then the following season. I was a magic maker and this was like you go for the audition and I got the job and I was a magic maker and that just entailed painting faces juggling escorting the character actor like baby bear around um and it was pretty much your job just to make guests happy that were staying at the hotel and that job when I would I would have been 20 21 when I was doing that job in between like during the summer breaks at at drama school, that job paid me 16 pounds an hour. Wow. That's when it was basically double the dollar, right? That is when it was double the dollar. And that is still to this day, when I was 20, 21, the best paying part-time job that I've ever had, like all the way up to to, I would like that job today. And And I bet they weren't taking out theme park union dues either. Nope. It was it was the best. And also, they would let you work double shifts. So you could turn up at six in the morning and work till two. And then you could start the shift at three and work to 11. And you could do a double shift, as many double shifts as you wanted, because it was all customer experience. Like, it was all about the customer experience. And it was, I'm, again, made lifelong friends. It's the best job I've ever had. And... Not that we did this because it was so well paying that we all wanted to do our best. Yeah. But it was so good that it was so easy to disappear for hours at a time. Because if some if a guest was like, Hey, I'm staying in the hotel and I'm out of milk, you'd just be like, you know what? I'm gonna drive down to the village. I'm gonna get you some milk. Is there anything else you want? I will be right back. And you could just vanish for three hours and then come back and be like, I got your milk. And they'd be like, oh my gosh, this is the best hotel experience I've ever had. And awesome. I'm surprised you didn't try out for Disney. I oh my like God. Just, oh, I mean, I probably would if, if it wasn't down in Anaheim, if there was a way yeah. to like get there on public transport. Also, this, this goes, I mean, this is, this is not something that I would associate with any kind of, uh, uh, or any theme park I've ever been to. This is more of like a high-end concierge at a resort hotel. And yeah, I mean, this this was like the Alton Towers Hotel. And then they expanded and they had a hotel called Splash Landings. Uh, so they had these two hotels that were supposed to drive people from across the country to come here and then spend a weekend or however many days at the at the park. And it was also great health wise for me because again i'm a big guy and i I put on weight very readily um but because you would start at six in the morning and you would be entertaining guests at the hotel and then you would walk them to the theme park so that they could get in an hour early that was like a 25 minute walk because the monorail wasn't open already and then it was a 25 minute walk back through the woods and the wilderness and you were just on your feet for like eight to 16 hours a day and oh man, my jawline came out to play. 
<laughs> I was looking good. Um, yeah, it was it was honestly that was hands down the best job that I have had. And then if that day job was here, if Alton Towers was, if this was how Universal operated, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, I would have had a whale of a time. Of, of course. course, it'd be the most in demand job in Hollywood. Oh my god. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I worked the Renaissance festivals. That was my first paid acting gig, and I was 17 or 18. And I thought that was great. They were uh -huh. just I worked Michigan Renaissance. I didn't travel with it, but um I I was like, man, I would do this. Yeah. I would do this everywhere because they, you know, they they treated you so well. You could disappear. All you were doing, all you're doing is acting the whole time yeah. as a character, making sure that guests who bought tickets are having a good time uh -huh. and you never break character and it's, she would take naps i would take naps and i i wrote a sign with my friend and we she put sleeping and i put uh -huh. beauties and we would take a nap for an hour under a tree if you were doing the magic maker shift where you were the s i couldn't i mean i have pictures and i did get into the costume but i was too big to fit into the baby bear costume but <laughs> if you mm -hmm. if you were baby bear chaperone for the day baby bear worked 20 minutes on 20 minutes off so you would just go out and you would escort the character and talk to guests. And then you would go and have a break for 20 minutes. Like every 20 minutes, you had a 20 minute break. And That's it right. was, it was delightful. And, and you didn't even have to wear the bear costume. I and it also, bear it, costume. It, it, um, it, it also, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, infuses isn't the word, but it also sort of gives you that taste of what acting can be like when you actually get to do it. It was, you know, because it was so well paid and you know yes we we were all young when we were doing it but it made us want to work harder because we were yeah. being well paid and it was a good job and i yes. didn't mind working 16 hours and i was like oh my gosh are you kidding london is so expensive i'm gonna do like all the 16 hour shifts that i can do this is insane and it, i had fun and I didn't mind yeah. getting home at midnight and then getting back up at six in the morning to to go and do it all over again because it was an enjoyable environment. And your friends were there because everybody was like fun. Yeah, everyone was yeah. like fun and in entertainment and it was silly and I learned to juggle and I learned to face paint and I learned to do poi and all this fun stuff. And yeah, just the best, the best kind of like side hustle job that you could have. And I did, I did love HMV in London as well because I'm a film fan and they did operate good alphabetical system. But that was <laughs> that I'm was I'm not also... gonna tell you about my alphabetical system. Oh no, don't no, it's alphabetized by shelf because when I get so many new books, oh okay, I don't want to like separate the shelf to put in the books each time. Okay. Like I'm constantly getting books. So oh, I alphabetize by shelf. See that feeds and sustain anytime i get a new blu-ray we need new shells I, we have yeah. a pile forming yeah, it's beautiful um, but i i love reorganizing my shelves mm. to fit in new blu-rays i have a six and a half year old i'm organizing his toys so mm -hmm. much that i don't have time for my books yeah i get on it on the shelves but i, I love it. you and no, I, yeah. I i think you're very handsome i think six five is like so special like, I just want to tell you, thank you so much. Like, you were so honest and, and vulnerable yeah. and real with us. And it's such a joy to talk to you and know you. I feel like I've known you forever. Well, thank You're you. Lovely. No, thank you so much. Um, it's so funny. We never get to talk about our day jobs. Like, uh, like yeah. this is so fun. Um, well, I just, I really just wanted people to feel like they're not alone. And mm -hmm. like, you know, even if it's not acting that you're working towards, I think Gen X, millennials, Gen Z, like we're in, we're in a world where one job isn't what we retire from necessarily. Uh -huh. That's a unique position to be in yeah. these days um, to um, sustain that. But. And I have no qualm, you know, if, if ever knock on wood, I have to go do it. Like I'll do it again. Like if I have to go get a job at the Lemley right here, I'll like, yeah, it works at the movie theater. I'll, I, we do what we have to do and it drives me nuts especially british tabloids are terrible for this you mm -hmm. know people that have worked in soaps for a while and then they're splashed on the front page and be like look how far they've fallen now they're working at tesco and it drives oh, me they nuts do that here too that, they do that's that. what prompted us ah there's just um, no shame in having a day job that sustains what you want to do or like helps feed you your family yeah <laughs> It's it it's baffling to me that 
the, there's shame or like people point that out and be like mm-hmm. he used to be on tv and now he's working now he's stocking nine groceries at trader joe's like yeah. oh good no. for him and you used good. to be a journalism major and now you're writing bullshit headlines it's, yeah. uh, now you are, now you write clickbait that and that isn't what i should have said <laughs> oh but yeah thank you so much thank, thank you, you so thank much. you so much for, for doing this she showed on we would like to thank our guest dominic burgess make that paper is us jamie parker stickle and jason bieber episodes mixed and edited by jason bieber our theme song is monday girl by jordan bieber make that paper is hosted on anchor fm if you like the show do what all podcasts ask you to do Subscribe, rate, review, and share and talk about it on social media, at work, family gatherings, and at your favorite watering hole. Tune in next week for another great guest. Mm